Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our online service from Trinity Reformed Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's a great joy uh, to have you join with us this evening for this uh, online service, and we trust that you'll know the Lord's blessing as we gather together around the throne of grace in this way. Uh, just one announcement this evening, and that is to remind our members that our home fellowship groups will be meeting by means of Zoom, as usual, this week, Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock and Friday afternoon at 12.30. And if you haven't been coming along to any of our home groups, if you're not attached to a particular group and you would like to be, uh, then please do check uh, the WhatsApp group for the congregation for details of the elders in charge of those different groups. And we can make sure that you are included in the invitation list. Uh, can I just remind you, please, not to share uh, the details of any Zoom meetings. Don't give out uh, the meeting IDs or passwords to anyone outside our own congregation. And I think that's all that I need to say uh, by way of announcement. So let us now join together in the worship of God. The psalmist says in Psalm 66, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Well, let's join together in singing praise to God as we uh, sing the praise of his name from Psalm number 22. Psalm 22, uh, you'll find it on page 40 in the psalm book, and we're going to sing stanzas 16 to 21. Psalm 22, stanzas 16 to 21. And here we have a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead and proclaiming God's name to his brothers in the church. And then that good news goes beyond the Jewish circle out into the whole world to earth's remotest shore as all the Gentile nations turn to worship and adore the Lord Jesus Christ. And these words, which of course were uh, supremely true of Jesus, were true also for Saul of Tarsus. We're going to be thinking about that this evening, how the Lord raised him from spiritual death to be a new creation in Christ, carrying the name of Jesus to his Jewish brothers and then also to the Gentiles, to the ends of the earth. So let's sing together Psalm 22, stanzas 16 to 21. From lions, mouth, by God's hands, Lord, O say, God answered prayer. I'll to whom my brothers in the church your name praise and declare. Let those who fear the Lord 
when I proclaim my praise of you, then all the church will hear, and I will pay my vows in full when men hold him in join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words that you have given us to sing in praise. These words that were written a thousand years before Jesus of Nazareth was born in Bethlehem. And yet words that speak so clearly and directly of his death upon the cross, the agonies of his sufferings for our sins. We thank you, Father, that this psalm also speaks of his triumph over death. For how you would save him from the lion's mouth, from wild oxen's horns, how you would answer his prayer and raise him up to new life and that he would declare your praise to his brothers. Lord God, we thank you for how this psalm was fulfilled and continues to be fulfilled ever since the gospel went out from Jerusalem into Judea and then into Samaria and from there to the ends of the earth. We praise you for how this has been going on for 2,000 years. We praise you, Lord God, that it is still happening this very night, that all over the world, even though churches are not able to meet uh, in person, we thank you that by means of the internet, the gospel is still going out that it is still being proclaimed to the ends of the earth. We pray, Lord God, that in these days when there is so much disruption in the world, we pray that the gospel would still run swiftly and be glorified. We pray indeed that it would spread even more quickly in these days, that it would be shared all the more quickly by means of social media and the internet. We pray, Heavenly Father, that there would be many people, even here in our own community of Newton Abbey, who would hear the gospel, who perhaps would not otherwise have come to church to hear the gospel. We pray, Heavenly Father, for anyone listening to this message at this moment. We pray that you would be speaking to them that your Holy Spirit would be at work in their hearts to open their eyes to the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, to see him as he truly is, risen and ascended at, and seated at the right hand of God. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they would come this very night to worship and to adore the Lord Jesus, that they would turn to him 
from their sin and from their rebellion and put their trust in him as their saviour, that they would bow the knee to him as their Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that for each one of us who have already turned to Christ, that you would minister to us to build us up in our faith, to draw us closer to yourself, to make us more like Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue that good work that you have begun in each one of us, enabling us to serve you and to obey you and to love you more fully, more deeply in the days that lie ahead. So, Father, we look to you to bless us and speak to us now through your word, by your spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to read together from God's Word as we find it in the New Testament and in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9. And we're going to begin our reading at verse 19. Acts chapter 9. And we're beginning uh, actually in the middle of verse 19. We're continuing. Uh, to work our way through the book of Acts. And we're thinking this evening particularly about the person that Saul of Tarsus became. The person that Saul became. And we see that uh, laid out. We see that transformation uh, very graphically here in these verses. Acts 9, uh, beginning to read in verse 19. For some days... He was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose? to bring them bound before the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, and brought him to the apostles, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, uh, please keep that passage open in front of you as we come to consider this evening Acts 9, 19 to 30. And I want you to imagine, uh, first of all, as we begin, uh, that uh, Dr. Richard Dawkins has come to Belfast to speak at the keynote address 
of a gathering of Humanists UK, the association that used to be called the British Humanist Association, but which has been renamed Humanists UK. And Richard Dawkins, this renowned atheist, this militant atheist, comes to address a packed meeting in the Ulster Hall that is crammed full of humanists. They're all eagerly awaiting uh, what this celebrated learned atheist is going to say. What particular way is he going to attack Christianity this evening? Uh, in, in what particular way is he going to expose the, the folly uh, and the nonsense of religion? And a hush falls on the gathering as Dawkins comes forwards to the podium. He clears his throat and he says in a loud and clear voice, I want to begin this evening by declaring to you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I want to call each and every one of you to repent of your sins and to trust him as your Savior. You can imagine the reaction that there would be. What a bombshell! Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous, notorious atheists in the world who's made a career out of denouncing religion in general and Christianity in particular. And now he's standing up publicly declaring that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you can imagine uh, that the organizers of that conference uh, tackling Dawkins and saying, who are you and what have you done with Richard Dawkins? And really, that doesn't even begin to come close to the shock that there would have been among the people who listened to Saul of Tarsus after his conversion to Christianity. And that's what we want to consider this evening. We've thought already about the person that Saul was. We've thought about the person that he met, the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. We've thought about the person that God used in uh, establishing him after his conversion, uh, the, the man Ananias. And now this evening we want to think about the person that Saul became. The person that Saul became. And as I uh, reflected on these verses, I, I tried to imagine two meetings in Damascus that took place on two consecutive days. The first meeting took place on the Saturday after Saul's conversion. Here is this great rabbi, this renowned scholar, this champion of the true faith who has stood up so boldly and so ably and so zealously against this heretical cult of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Saul's zeal was as legendary as his learning. Uh, he has come all the way from Jerusalem just in case there are any Christians sheltering in Damascus. You can imagine what an occasion it was for the synagogues in Damascus to have this famous scholar among them. The synagogue would have been full, every seat taken, standing room only. What an honor to have such a great man addressing them. What is he going to say? How is he going to show them that Saturday in Damascus that all this talk about a crucified Messiah was nonsense? You could have heard a pin drop, I'm sure, as Saul begins to speak. And then the bombshell drops because what he says is, I am here to tell you 
that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. Can you imagine the utter astonishment and dismay and outrage and confusion? Luke records the reaction of Saul's hearers for us in verse 21 here. He says they were amazed. And that word in the original is a very strong word. It describes astonishment mixed with fear caused by an extraordinary event that is hard to understand. That's what these people in the synagogues of Damascus experienced as Saul began to preach. Astonishment mixed with fear because what they are hearing and witnessing is so utterly extraordinary, so mystifying to their minds. Luke goes on and records the rest of their words uh, in verse 21. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests. In other words, they are saying, in effect, who are you and what have you done with Saul of Tarsus? That's the first meeting. The second meeting takes place the very next day, on the first day of the week. As the Christians gather together, in someone's home. Perhaps it was Ananias's home. And Saul comes into the meeting. He doesn't come in smashing through the door with armed men to arrest and bind the believers. That's what he had come to Damascus to do. But that's not what he's going to do now. He comes into the house to join them as they pray in the name of Jesus and as they worship the Lord together. Try to imagine this man sitting in the midst of these believers, sharing his testimony, telling them how the Lord met him on the road outside their city and how he changed him. Try to imagine Saul looking those refugees from Jerusalem in the eye, those men and women and children who had to flee their homes, who had to leave everything behind because of him, because he was going around Jerusalem from house to house, destroying the church. Try to imagine Saul looking widows and orphans in the eye. Widows and orphans because of him. It's not hard to imagine him, is it? Humbly confessing his sin and asking with tears for forgiveness. And forgiveness was granted. And they exchange the holy kiss of greeting And they sit together at the Lord's table. They share the bread and the wine that is a symbol of their unity. A symbol, a picture that they are all one body in Christ. Perhaps Saul, this great scholar with his encyclopedic knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures and all the commentaries that had ever been written on them, He sits down and he asks these Christians questions about their faith. He wants to know how they were converted. How did the Lord Jesus meet them? Perhaps he shares with them some of the things that the Lord has already opened his eyes to understand. Two meetings on consecutive days, but so very different. And these two meetings illustrate for us, don't they, in the starkest possible way, the person that Saul 
has become. As he would put it later on in his letter to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Well, I want us to look at this subject today. I want us to think about this transformation that Saul experienced under two headings. As we think about the person that he became, I want us to think, first of all, about his commission and then the fulfillment of his commission. Because these verses in 19 to 30 are really the outworking of the commission that the Lord gave to Saul on the Damascus road and then in the days afterward through Ananias. So first of all, uh, let's think about Saul's commission. And to see this, we need to go back to verses 15 and 16 of chapter 9. <clears throat> Saul's commission, verses 15 and 16. What happened on the Damascus road and what happened after the Damascus road is highly significant for all kinds of reasons. Of course, it was a very dramatic thing. For Saul, it was a terrifying thing. And, of course, it was a gracious thing. It was a defining moment for Saul theologically. Because in that moment, when he met the risen Christ, when he realized, when the penny dropped, when his eyes were opened, even though he was blinded physically, his spiritual eyes were opened and he was able to see that Jesus really was the Lord, the Son of God. At that moment, the whole of the Old Testament clicked into place, as it were, and he suddenly was able to understand it rightly. All of those things certainly are going on here on the Damascus Road, but there's more than that. Because this whole episode is full of Old Testament echoes. As we read this record of Saul's conversion, it's meant to set all kinds of bells ringing in our minds. We're meant to read chapter 9 of Acts and think to ourselves, I've seen something like this before in Scripture. There's a recurring pattern here. And that is exactly what we ought to think. Because these verses ought to remind us of the call of various prophets in the Old Testament. Because that is really what is happening here. Saul is being called and commissioned as a prophet. And that is made explicit in verses 15 and 16, where the Lord spells out his agenda for the rest of Saul's life. And we're going to see that there are two things that are involved in fulfilling this commission. Speaking about the name of Jesus and suffering for the name of Jesus. First of all, speaking about the name of Jesus. We see that in verse 15, speaking about the name of Jesus. Here's the first component, the first part of Saul's commission. This name that up until this point Saul has hated and blasphemed and opposed with all his might, now from this moment on he's going to carry this name as a precious treasure to all the nations of the world, to the Gentiles, even to kings, as well as to the Jews. In other words, Saul is going to be a preacher of Jesus Christ. He's going to proclaim who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. He's going to tell the world that Jesus of Nazareth is the eternal Son of God. 
that he is the Christ, the promised Messiah, that he is the Lord, the sovereign one. He's going to tell people that Jesus came into this world and lived a life of perfect obedience to God's law, the life that you and I cannot live. He's going to tell people that Jesus died the cursed death of the cross, that he took the punishment that our sins deserve as he assumed liability for our guilt and our sin. He's going to tell the nations that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead on the third day and that he ascended up into heaven and that he sits at God's right hand, that he is reigning over the whole universe. All authority and power has been given to him and that one day he is going to come again from heaven to judge the living and the dead. He's going to tell the nations that Jesus Christ calls all men to repent and trust him as their savior, to be united to him by faith. This is his message. This is what he is being commissioned to preach. This is the theme of all of Paul's letters in one way or another, as he unpacks the awesome glorious majesty of the person and the work of Jesus Christ the Lord. As he says to the Corinthians, we preach Christ and him crucified. Or as he says to the Colossians, him we proclaim. Speaking about the name of Jesus. But then the second element of Saul's commission is suffering for the name of Jesus. He's going to suffer for the name of Jesus. We see that in verse 16. Just as God warned some of the Old Testament prophets when he called them and commissioned them to service, he warned them that they would suffer in his service. So he warns Saul that he will suffer for the sake of his name. Just as Saul once inflicted suffering on Christians for the sake of Jesus' name, now he will be on the receiving end of that suffering. Saul the persecutor has become Saul the persecuted. Jesus says in verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. How much would Saul suffer for the sake of Christ's name? We don't know. He suffered a lot. He suffered a great deal. And yet there's so much that we don't know about Saul's suffering. There are many incidental references, little occasional asides about his suffering. And then there are a few explicit statements. He talks, for example, to the Galatians of how he bore on his body the marks of Christ. The false teachers in Galatia were making a big deal out of circumcision, this mark on the body. And Paul says to them effectively, you want to talk about marks on the body? You want to glory in a mark cut into human flesh? Well, I have marks on my body. My flesh has been cut for the sake of Christ. As he was beaten again and again with rods, as he received five times the 39 lashes for the sake of the gospel. Ancient historians tell us that one dose of the 39 lashes was often enough to kill a man. Paul received it five times. He talks in Philippians about how he has lost everything for the sake of Christ. And when he says everything, he may well not be exaggerating. 
It's quite possible that he was disinherited by his parents when he was converted. It's very likely that he was divorced by his wife. Saul was a member of the Sanhedrin, and certainly it was normal practice at least for members of the Sanhedrin to be married. So it's very likely that Saul was married at some point, but there is no wife later on, he says that. Perhaps she died, but perhaps more likely she disowned him when he became a Christian. For whose sake I have lost all things. There's that remarkable catalogue of Paul's sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11, most of which are not even mentioned in the book of Acts. These are things that happened at another time that we don't know about. In 1 Corinthians 4, 13, Paul says, We have become and are still like scum of the world, refuse of all things. That's how he was regarded by the world. That's how he was treated, the scum of the world. Or as he puts it in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8, we are afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So death is at work in us. Suffering, how much suffering. And why? It was all for the sake of the name of Jesus. And yet that's a price that Saul is glad to pay, a price that he will cheerfully pay. He says in Philippians 3 verse 7, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He's going to speak about the name of Jesus. And he's going to suffer for the name of Jesus. Now, we are not called to be prophets in the way that Saul was. We haven't been given exactly the same commission that he has. We're not called to preach to kings and to nations. But brothers and sisters, as Christians, we are called to carry the name of Jesus into the world. We are to show him by our lives and we're to speak of him as we have opportunity. We are called to be the Lord's witnesses. And doing that will involve suffering. And I wonder, are we prepared for that suffering when it comes? Saul's commission. But then uh, we want to come to our passage this evening, verses 19 to 30, to see the fulfillment of this commission, or at least the beginning of the fulfillment of this commission. The whole of the rest of Saul's life is going to see these two strands speaking for Jesus, speaking about the name of Jesus, and suffering for Jesus Uh, The whole of Saul's life is going to see these two strands working out. But Luke draws attention here to their immediate fulfillment in verses 19 to 30. And what Luke is doing here is he is taking three years of Saul's life and condensing them down into these 11 verses. Paul tells us in Galatians 1, 17 and 18, that he spent three years in Arabia, preaching and reading and learning. And he did that uh, between verse 22 and verse 23 of Acts 9. Three years in Arabia, a kingdom that was off to the east 
of Damascus. But Luke doesn't mention that here in Acts. He passes over that period in silence. And the reason for that is presumably because he wants us to see this same pattern repeated in both Damascus and Jerusalem. A pattern that is going to be repeated many, many times over throughout Saul's life. In fact, we're going to see this pattern almost every time that we meet Saul in the book of Acts. Preaching, persecution, escape. Preaching, persecution, escape. Verses 15 and 16 that we've looked at already really set the tone, as it were, for Saul's life. This commission to speak about Jesus and to suffer for Jesus. That is what his whole life is going to be about. That's what his whole life is going to look like. And Luke shows us that immediately in verses 19 to 30. So let's see then this commission fulfilled. First of all, speaking about the name of Jesus. Speaking about the name of Jesus. There's no hanging about with Saul, is there? Verse 20 tells us that immediately, immediately, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. Now that he knows the truth about Jesus, he is as zealous to share it with others as he had been to suppress it before. And just notice three things in particular about Saul's witness in Damascus and in Jerusalem as he speaks about the name of Jesus. Just notice three things. Notice, first of all, how Christ-centered it is. We're told that he proclaimed Jesus, that he proclaimed Jesus as the Son of God, in fact. That shows us how mature Saul's understanding was right from the very beginning of his Christian life. He's clearly been reflecting deeply already, just in the few days since he was converted. He's been reflecting deeply on the person of Jesus. He's been joining the dots in his mind, uh, as it were, about the Old Testament. He's been seeing that Jesus of Nazareth is, in fact, the Son of God, referred to in the Old Testament scriptures. We're told in verse 22 that he proved that Jesus was the Christ. This is part of speaking about Jesus. He proved that Jesus was the Christ, that he really was the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. And this word proved, it's used to describe setting two things side by side for the purpose of comparison. And that's what Saul does. That's what Saul always does all through his ministry. Whenever he speaks to people who knew the scriptures of the Old Testament, he would prove from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ he would set down these two things for comparison, the Old Testament scripture and the fulfillment in Jesus of Nazareth. And then he would say, as it were, QED, the case is proved. He does it in Damascus and he does the same thing when he goes to Jerusalem. He preached boldly the name of Jesus in Damascus, according to Barnabas in verse 27. And in Jerusalem, he preaches boldly in the name of the Lord. His proclamation, his speaking about Jesus is Christ-centered. Well, that is a challenge, isn't it, brothers and sisters, for you and for me? I wonder how much time we spend thinking, first of all, about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you were to be locked down uh, even more uh, in a more restricted way than you are already this week, if, if I were to put you into a room with no books and no devices, not even a Bible, and told you just to sit there for one hour meditating 
on Jesus Christ, I wonder how you would fare. I wonder how much information about Jesus you have in your head and in your heart to begin with. How much of his teaching have you memorized? I wonder how much we really do speak about Jesus Christ. Is, is he the overflow of what's in our hearts? Is he the great topic of conversation that we keep coming back to again and again? Whenever you give your testimony, how much of it is about you and how much of it is about the Lord Jesus? A friend of mine used to say that our testimony should be about Christ and about two minutes. Well, it should certainly be about Christ. It is troubling, isn't it, that we can talk a lot about faith. We can talk about these theological questions and, and problems that, that people have with the Bible. We can talk about the evidence for creation, the evidence for the resurrection. We can talk about abortion. We can talk about sexuality, all kinds of issues. And there's a place for all of those things. Don't get me wrong. But above all, how much do we talk about Jesus Christ how much do we talk about him with our children, with one another? How much of Christ is there in our lives? Paul's witness was Christ-centered. And our witness ought to be Christ-centered as well. Our lives should, as, as Paul puts it later on in, in the New Testament, he says that we are the aroma of Christ. That's what we're meant to be as Christians. We're meant to exude Christ from every pore in our bodies, as it were. He should be the, the, the thing that we love to talk about and think about and share with others and read about and sing about. Christ-centered. Then secondly, we see that Saul's witness is spirit-empowered. As he speaks about Jesus, that speaking is spirit-empowered. He was filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 17. And then verse 22 says that Saul increased in strength. And that word is often used of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. He increases in the strength of the Spirit. He is empowered by the Spirit. He's being constantly filled by the Spirit so that he is more and more enlightened in his understanding. As he thinks and as he prays and as he reads the Old Testament scriptures, the Holy Spirit is opening his eyes to see more and more truth in God's Word, to help him to join more and more of the dots of the unfolding of God's revelation in the Old Testament. This is the Holy Spirit's great ministry. This is what he loves to do, to glorify Jesus Christ like floodlights, uh, showing up more and more of his person and his work and his majesty. And Paul experienced that, that illumination, that enlightening, that empowering of the Holy Spirit as he spoke about Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul tells his readers that he is praying that they would experience this very thing more and more. And that's something that we should pray for for ourselves as well, that we will know more of the empowering of the Holy Spirit to equip us to witness to Jesus. It's something that we should pray for, something that we should expect to happen to us as we open up our Bibles in the morning to do our quiet time, as we open up the Word with our children and our families to have family worship, as we sit together under the preaching of God's Word, we should expect that the Holy Spirit will be opening our eyes 
so that we can see more of Jesus. And as we speak about Jesus, as Paul was here, we should believe that the Holy Spirit will work in us and through us, that he will do this work that he delights in more than any other, magnifying the beauty of the Son of God, opening other blind eyes to see Jesus, either for the first time or with ever-increasing clarity. But what a, what a wretched thing it would be, wouldn't it, to witness to non-Christians if this were not a reality. To, to, to try to speak to people about Jesus Christ who cannot see the glory of Jesus Christ because they're dead in their sins. To try to speak to people like that without the Holy Spirit opening their eyes. Let's pray that we will be Spirit-empowered as we speak about Jesus. Christ-centered, Spirit-empowered, and then we see also how Saul's witness was courageous. As he spoke about the name of Jesus, he spoke courageously. We're told in verse 27 and verse 28 how he preached boldly in Damascus and in Jerusalem. It's no small thing, is it, to stand before those who are going to be extremely hostile to your message. And to say what you know you need to say without holding back. People who switch sides are never popular with their old side. So here's an extra layer of uh, difficulty for Saul. Not only is he preaching to people who are hostile, but he's preaching to people whose side he used to be on before he switched sides. In Jerusalem, Saul had been the great champion of orthodoxy against this new heretical cult. And now here he is proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. And especially in verse 29, we're told that he disputes there with the Hellenist Jews. These were the same people that Stephen had debated with. This was Saul's old synagogue these were the men and the women that he rubbed shoulders with and worshipped with. He had been their top debater, and now he's on the other side. He's continuing the work of Stephen, debating this time against his old friends. It takes courage, doesn't it, to stand against those who once were friends and allies. Saul's witness is courageous. And we need Christians with this kind of courage today, don't we? Because our society has become much more hostile to Christianity than at any time in any of our lifetimes. This is a very different world now that we are called to witness in. The values of our world, the values of our culture, the values of our particular society here in Northern Ireland are no longer the same as the values of the church. And it takes great courage to speak about Christ faithfully to anybody, but especially perhaps to your friends. And for some of you, to your own family members whose worldview is so very different from our own. Courage is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Don't think to yourself, well, I'm just not a very brave person. I don't have very much courage. Your courage will grow the more you stretch it, the more you put yourself out of your comfort zone. The Lord will grow your courage more and more. So Paul, Saul speaks about the name of Jesus. And he does so uh, in a Christ-centered way, in the power of the Spirit, and with great courage. But then we see in these verses also how uh, the fulfillment of the second part of Saul's commission, suffering for the name of Jesus. Suffering for the name of Jesus. We see the Lord's prediction about Saul suffering 
for the sake of his name, fulfilled both in Damascus and in Jerusalem. Luke tells us about two plots against Saul in these verses. In both Damascus and Jerusalem, the Jews couldn't answer Saul's arguments with logic. And so they responded with force. They try to have him killed. And both times, the Lord preserves him. Of course, this is just the beginning for Saul, isn't it? This is just the first of countless incidents where, when Saul is going to suffer for the name of Christ. And in a lesser way, we are going to suffer for the sake of Christ, aren't we? I wonder, are we prepared to do that? We're not likely to be called to suffer anything like Saul was, although many Christians are today. In Pakistan, in India, in North Korea, in Nigeria, many of our brothers and sisters are suffering horrendous persecution. Now, most of us won't suffer in those ways, but there is still a great cost to carrying the name of Jesus into the world. And we need to be prepared to pay that cost. For some of us, perhaps, it will mean losing friends, either in real life or on Facebook because of the things that you share, asking people to sign a petition against abortion, saying something uh, negative about the LGBT agenda. You need to be prepared to be misunderstood. Some of you young people need to be prepared to miss out on job opportunities. We need to be prepared to have the reputation of being a fanatic, perhaps being shunned in our schools or colleges, to suffer the pain of being thought strange or weird by our peers because of the things that we will not do because of Christ. And we need to be able to say, like Paul, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Suffering for the name of Jesus. This is the end of Luke's account of Saul's conversion. It begins with Saul leaving Jerusalem with an official mandate from the high priest to arrest Christians. And it ends with him leaving Jerusalem once again, but this time as a Christian and carrying a far greater mandate from the Lord Jesus Christ to go and make Christians by carrying the Lord's name into the whole world. It's an account of a wonderful transformation. The person Saul became. And it's a tremendous encouragement, isn't it, to us to keep on proclaiming the name of Jesus courageously in the world. Because what God did here to Saul, he can do to anyone. John Stott says there are many Sauls of Tarsus in the world they're just waiting for the gospel. Talented, intelligent men and women of personality and drive and energy and initiative. They have the courage of their non-Christian convictions. They're utterly sincere, but they're misguided. They're sincerely wrong. They're hard. They're stubborn, perhaps even fanatical in their rejection of Jesus Christ, but they are not beyond his sovereign grace. And Stott challenges us and says, we need more faith and more holy expectation to pray for these 
Saul's of Tarsus. Because surely the early Christians prayed for Saul before he was converted. This was what Jesus taught them to do, wasn't it? To pray for their enemies, to pray for those who persecuted them. And here is this man, Saul, who has made himself their enemy, who is persecuting them with all of the resources that are at his disposal. And they pray for him in their churches and in their homes. And look at how the Lord answers their prayer, answers Stephen's prayer as he was being stoned to death. Father, forgive them. The Lord answered those prayers in a remarkable way. Well, let's pray that he would do the same for the souls of Tarsus in our community. Amen. Well, let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the prayers that you answered, the prayers that you first of all inspired in those early Christians, enabling them to pray for this man, Saul, who was ravaging the church, who was persecuting them even to death. We thank you, Lord God, for the remarkable work of grace that you did in this man's life. How you opened his eyes to see the truth of the gospel, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe that he is the Son of God, the Lord, the Messiah. Father, we praise you for this transformation, for the person that Saul became in your hands, this new creation through the reconciliation of Jesus Christ. Father, what you did for Saul, we pray that you would do again. We thank you that there is no one who is too hard, too stubborn, too extreme, too unbelieving to be beyond the reach of your grace. We pray now, Father, for those perhaps listening to this message who are not yet Christians. We pray that you would work in their heart at this very moment, drawing them to Jesus Christ. We pray that you will help us, Father, for our part in our smaller, more humble ways to be witnesses for you, to speak about Jesus. We pray that our conversation and our lives may be Christ-centered, that they might be spirit-empowered, that they might be courageous. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to be prepared to suffer for the name of Jesus, as Saul was, whatever that may mean for each one of us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to bring our service to a close by singing praise together from Psalm 44. Psalm 44, it's on page 90 in the psalm book. We're going to sing stanzas 15 to the end of the psalm. Psalm 44, stanzas 15 to 19. Paul quotes stanza 17. In Romans chapter 8, he is reflecting on the sufferings of the Christian life, sufferings that come on Christians who are being faithful, just as the psalmist says here in stanza 14. Uh, All this has come on us, yet we have not forgotten you. And to the covenant you made, we have not been untrue. Our heart has not turned back nor from your way have our steps strayed. They're suffering, these believers, even though they haven't forsaken the Lord. And yet, Paul, as he quotes these words, is triumphant because he goes on to say, in all these things, we are more than conquerors 
through him who loved us. In all this suffering, in all this hardship, in all this affliction, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Well, may that be our attitude as we speak of Christ and suffer for Christ in these coming weeks and months and years. Psalm 44, stanzas 15 to 19. Let us praise God. Oh, heart has not turned back, nor from your way have our steps strayed. Yet you must crush where jackals run, us covered with dead shade. If we've forgotten our God's name, to false gods stretched our hands, will God not find this out since he our secrets understands. But for your sake we're slain all day and seen as sheep for meat. Rise, Lord, forever, don't cast off. Awake, why do you sleep? Why do you hide your face and so forget how we're distressed? And our afflicted for our souls down to the dust far grass. Our bodies also to the earth hold fast, rise up, away to help us and deliver us for your And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.